Good morning. It's an honor for me this morning to be able to introduce to you our keynote speaker, uh, uh, Terrence uh, Chapman. You know, uh, what's interesting, I'm hearing the message this morning about transformational leadership, and he is widely recognized as being a transformational leader. His accomplishments in both public and private enterprise, entrepreneurship, education, and ministry are sh shadowed by his humble and inspiring transformational leadership style. He's influenced countless organizational and community-wide leaders by cultivating the love of Jesus Christ through innovative strategic thinking. And I got to thinking about that. Innovation doesn't exist in a vacuum. It requires a leader to carve out an intentional space for people to talk about innovation, something new. And how do you do that? Do you do that through the vain imagination of men? Or do you do it by integrating some ideas that are not man-made, but rather Christ-enabled? This leader is Christ-centered in everything he does. He sees God in everything and everyone. He's carved out that intentional space for integrating faith in Christ, not only in strategic conversations in the workplace, but also in discussions uh, that are in the way decisions are made and carried out. He casts a vision for next generation leaders by equipping and inspiring his mentees through exemplar servant leadership. Now this is my observation of uh, Terrence Chapman. In many ways, his achievements represent a musical composition, if you will, a continuous symphony with a central theme that takes on variations and movements and tempos, but the patterns he develops, his chords, his creative impulses, the melodies, the rhythms, the creative innovations, these are founded in spiritual truths and evidence in the way he thinks, talks, and walks. And it's revealed through his Christian values, his understanding and knowledge of the word. His commitments, sensitivities, passions are evident through his ability to cultivate deeply meaningful relations. And these are relations that are not transformational because of uh, anything he does. It's really, when you think about it, spirit-led leadership. Transformational leaders are really spirit-led. And so he has this relationship that he develops with his followers and mentees that is really spirit-led. He loves and appreciates God's creations and respects and inspires others to do the same. When you think about it, his accomplishments are really arresting. It is with great pleasure I have the opportunity to introduce to you this morning Mr. Terrence Chapman. Well, thank you for that uh, warm and, and generous introduction. I'm sure that I'll look for the guy that that, uh, that links up to. Uh, but I heard this morning that someone in the building at least loved Jesus. Uh, I don't know if anyone else in this building loved Jesus like I heard this morning. But I heard that somebody loves Jesus. Uh, Bill, I'm honored to be here. And I, I knew there was something about, it, about you that I liked, number one. Uh, you do attend Atlanta Bread Company, which I own for a number of years, and so praise the Lord. You keep my stock going. I need all the help I can get. Um, but secondly, I met some old friends here uh, from Focus on the Family uh, with Dr. Leland and so many others, and it's just warm to be back here in Colorado. I'm honored to be here, and I'm honored today around this symposium 2013. And how fitting a theme, redeeming the time. Very appropriate theme for this. Uh, following Christ in a secular era. You know, I'm encouraged by this era, as I'm going to share with you in a minute. But I'm an optimist by nature. And so I have to look at things half full versus half empty. You know, I just remember 2,000 years ago when uh, Peter and 12 disciples stood up and uh, we saw a movement start at that time, and now there's billions of Christians who are following Jesus. The challenge is there's three more billion that we need to go after, and so it's a task. And so I just wanted to start this morning and just ask, 
maybe by you standing, if nothing else, for a good stretch. How many people in this building today love Jesus? Wow. Thank you so much. Well, doctor, it, it appears that uh, uh, many people in this building love Jesus. So we've already accomplished half of Matthew 28, to go and evangelize, and so we've evangelized. So I'm going to challenge us in a different area. I'm going to challenge us in an area around Matthew 28 that says not only to go and evangelize, but to go and make disciples who go and make disciples. That's the challenge that I want to talk to you about today. And it looks like we have a lot of followers of Jesus here. So now let's get on about the business of making disciples who can go and make disciples. And that's the challenge I want to challenge you with. You know, Bill and uh, trustees and CCU staff and Falcony, uh, thank you for inviting me here today. It's such an honor. Uh, as you know, Bill, I, uh, in a few days we start our international conference. Um, and uh, as he invited me here, I said, boy, I, I just don't know, Bill, if I can make this. Uh, it's just too close to our annual conference. But as I begin to pray through this process, I have a heart for this young generation, for this rising generation that I'm calling you. And I just felt compelled that there's no other place I'd rather be than right here at this moment, at this time, to speak with you this morning. I hope that I encourage you. I, I, I pray that I, I stir you up just a little bit. I want you to know that you are our future. You are the bright light that I see shining. You are the potential city on the hill for many to see. I believe in this generation. I believe that you have what it takes to get the job done. I just believe in you for some reason. Prove me right. So, but we have a responsibility as these, uh, these little older generation. We have a responsibility to nurture you and to legacy leaders to pour into you because I believe this generation has something much greater than we had. And so I'm encouraged by it. Well, this morning I'd like to speak to you on the subject, following God into the marketplace. Some may not think that you can follow God in the marketplace, but I want you to know that God is alive and well in the marketplace. Not only is he alive and well in the marketplace, but he's alive in the marketplace all around the world. All around the world we can experience Chick-fil-A's uh, and, and samples of Chick-fil-A's all around the world. Do you believe that? You probably haven't heard about that, have you? But today I'm here to tell you that he is active in the marketplace. He's active all over. And so, you know, I, I reminded of Dr. Henry Blackaby. He says, you know, seek where the Lord is calling and follow him there. Well, I want you to know that the Lord is calling all around the world. And he's calling us around the world right now. The question is, what are you going to say when you go there? Wherever you may go after the two, three, four years here, where is he going to be calling you to? Well, I'm going to touch around the marketplace. And uh, this is particularly important subject here at CCU because as I understand your strategic objectives, to first honor Christ is what I read about your objectives. And secondly, to teach students to trust the Bible. That's a pretty good second objective. Thirdly, is to live holy lives. Boy, what a challenge, but it is certainly exactly what we're to be after. And third, to be evangelistic and to impact culture. Boy, that caught my eye. To impact culture in support of traditional values. That's exactly what I pray my life is about. That when we leave this place, culture will be changed. You know, I was challenged with that in growing up in Chicago, Illinois. And I often wondered how the Lord would use a snot-nosed kid who really didn't know much about the world, but whose father had a vision, whose father had a vision that culture could be impacted by the way you live your life. He had a vision that things could change, especially in business. You know, I never imagined that I would be standing here as president and CEO of the largest marketplace ministry in the world and talking to you about this day. I never imagined it when I was six years old with my pop bottle company and, and ran a little pop bottle business that one day I'd be the 
a senior executive at Coca-Cola. I never imagined at six years old that I'd be standing in front of you at CCU and talking to you about cultural transformation through the marketplace. But I want to talk to you about that this morning. I want to start out by asking you three questions to reflect on. Number one, how would you assess your effectiveness or progress towards these strategic objectives that I just read off to you? How are you doing? What type of progress are you making? Number two, are you ready to deal with the effects of when you practice the priesthood of the kingdom and yet there's opposing views all around you? Are you ready for that effect? Are you ready for the day that you achieve your most wondrous desires in this life? but it falls short of your expectation. It falls short of where he may be calling you to. And that's when you'll see Jesus more than you've ever seen him before. And number three, I wanna ask you this question. How strong, how steadfast, and how convicted is your stance? How strong, how convicted, how steadfast is your stance? You know, Paul says to count it all joy in persecution. Do we count it all joy? You know, many of us, we want to get to heaven. But some of us may not want to get to heaven right now. We just want to wait a little minute. We want to get to heaven, but the question is, are you ready to get to heaven right now? And how many people are you prepared to bring with you to heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ? Where it's hard to get others there without witnessing, without telling them, the glorious of who he is, the creator of this heaven and earth, the redemption that took place because of the fall, and the great privilege that he gives us and the honor that he gives us to call on the name of Jesus. It is a privilege. It is an honor. And from what I've seen here, you understand it all so well. So let's move into a vision that I want to paint, with, paint for you. And I'm here to tell you that business could be the central mission field for this century. In fact, I want to tell you that it's the largest platform in the world for ministry. There's 90 million businesses around the world that we can count. There's 27 million businesses here in the U.S. If you think about that, let me put it in perspective. Today, as far as we can count, there's around 5 million churches and around two million educational institutions of higher learning. If you just simply take 10% of the 90 million of businesses that exist in the world, that's nine million Christian-led businesses. It's the largest platform in the world for ministry. Have you ever thought about business that way? And at FCCI, Fellowship of Companies for Christ International, we're redefining the way business is done around the world. We're redefining the way people think about business, the way the pe people do business, and the priorities of business. We're redefining it all around the world. So we have a large platform to do ministry from. And so our vision is to see communities thriving because of business, to see nations transformed because of how we think about and do business, to see communities transformed, to see lives transformed, to see your life transformed through business. And it's a tall order because we know that that transformation can only come through Christ, one company leader at a time. You see, business leaders, they not only touch their staff, but they also touch vendors, they touch customers, and they can impact nations. You know, business leaders, we don't have to sneak Bibles into China because China wants business. Business leaders don't have to sneak the gospel into India because India wants business. Sometimes we have to sneak business into America because America may not want the type of business that we desire to have. But there's no good fight without opposition. <laughs> opposition is saying some things and, and we're reacting to what they say. They're acting a certain way and, and we're reacting to that way. 
and they're trying to turn the course of tide, and we're just turning it right back. We're in a battle. It's okay. He told you that from the beginning of the time you were going to be in a battle. The question is, where are you going to fight? Where are you going to stand? Where are you in the battle? Well, we're looking for leaders to lead the charge of Christendom to transform the world through Christ, one company leader at a time. That's our mission field. And so as I think about this, I want you to know that you are a splendid creation with eccentric value. That's who God made. You have eccentric value. You're not um, some waste. You, know, you were born to bring value to this life. And you are under the cultural mandate of his deity. That's who you are. You are a magnificent creation. And the ruler of all things, I mean, if you get that, that God is the ruler of all things, well, let's figure out what that means in Greek. All means what? All. You don't even have to be a scholar, a theologian to figure that out. All means all. He controls all. He's deity over all. That's who you're under kingship with. The king of kings, the lord of lords. And sometimes we just forget who's the deity around this place. Let me try to describe it as Isaiah described it. Remember, he goes to the heavenlies and he sees the king of kings in all of his magnificent glory. And as he viewed this, he, he's, oh, he was amazed. He put his hands over his lips and said, I'm not worthy. It's interesting that any time we see the deity, the people say, I'm not worthy. But yet, at the end of the process, he says, here I am, Lord. Send me. Well, where is he sending you to? I want to encourage you to consider the marketplace. You know, he raised Joseph in a desert to use him in a palace. But yet, we see that he also removed Saul, who we know now as Paul. He, re he took him from a palace and placed him in a desert. And this same Paul ended up being the apostle, being a disciple for a whole new Gentile nation. Isn't it amazing that the Lord can use Paul, he can use Saul, he can use Joseph, and he can use you here at CCU. He can use us all. And God has planted a burden in us that cannot be separated from ourselves. He has placed that burden. And for me, that burden is to teach your generation, this young rising generation, with the gospel and to prepare you for works of service. That is the challenge that we have before us now, is to go out and be ambassadors for Christ. Be ambassadors for the good news. It is good news. For those who even don't believe good news is good news, they know in reality that it is good news. They know in their heart that it's good news. Don't ever think that they don't understand that there's good news. They understand it. They may not totally understand it the way we do. They may not even accept it as we do. But they understand that there's something in this world that's bigger than them. They understand that this life is more than just this life. They know it. And so we have a privilege and honor in a gentle and winsome and loving way to tell them about who this God is, this magnificent creature, this creator of the heavens and the earth. And so FCCI is a nonprofit organization of CEO, peer and peer members who believe in a vision that this world can be transformed through Christ by the way we do business, the way we think about business, the way we prepare for business. And this next generation, which is you, have a burden to see that this torch continues down the pathway. And as president and CEO of FCCI, I have the privilege to work alongside these men and women, these amazing people in business who's blazing the trail, these Christian CEOs who are followers of Jesus Christ. It's happening in the workplace. It's happening more than you can imagine. 
and the workplace was having a significant impact on this culture. A significant impact on this culture. I mean, if you think about it, uh, many of you have probably heard what the Chick-fil-A when Dan Cathy came out and said a few words on how he felt about marriage. And uh, he was receiving 4,000 calls a day. But also, he had his biggest day in the history of Chick-fil-A. $30 million versus $11 million was his largest day. If I was his marketing advisor, I would have told him to go out there and say something else. <laughs> Just go say something else. I mean, don't shut down, Dan. Go out there and be bold and courageous. You got to be bold and courageous. I mean, he sold more chicken and lemonade that day than the history of Chick-fil-A. And, you know, an old Coca-Cola guy, I'm telling you, they were smiling. They were like, Dan, go out there and say something else. Go shake it up because there's a lot of remnants out there. Well, we define our purpose or mission at FCCI in this way. Notice the beginning. In pursuit of God's eternal objective in pursuit of his eternal objective. We equip and encourage Christian business leaders who are called to lead their life and their business by integrating biblical principles in the workplace. You see, we're not a Bible study, but we are sitting around the room in small groups. We call them business leadership groups. And we're talking about real business issues but we're looking at it from a biblical standpoint. How can we integrate biblical principles into our dialogue, into our discussion, into our worldview as to how to run a business? Is there a biblical way to hire and fire? Is there a biblical way to do marketing? Is there a biblical way to look at finance? Is there a biblical way to operate your business in a way that glorifies the Father? How do you use your business as a platform to do that? That's FCCI. Well, we do operate in these small groups for about an hour and a half each week. We're talking about these issues. We're wrestling with the issues. There's thousands of business leaders around the world. We're in 62 countries around the world. Yes, they are, uh, country, there are business leaders in Bangladesh that's leading their companies for Christ. I want you to know that there's business leaders in Africa that's leading their companies for Christ. I also want you to know that there's business leaders in Asia that's leading their companies for Christ. I want you to know that there's business leaders even in Europe that's leading their companies for Christ. And I also want you to know that there's business leaders in Latin America who's leading their companies for Christ. And yes, there are business leaders here in America that's leading their companies for Christ. Even Coca-Cola has 300 members who's leading their company for Christ. So I want you to know that the gospel is alive and well around the world in business. I want you to know that. I want you to know that there's hope. I want you to know that one day you'll be called into the workplace and you'll be asked to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to be bold and courageous. Will you stand? Will you die for something worth dying for? Will you fight for something worth fighting for? You know, these men and women are doing that. And so I want to talk to you about five core principles that they follow as they try to leverage their business for Christian. And uh, the one is the priesthood of a believer is a special calling to serve God and through his or her business or company, they see themselves as priests in the marketplace. Number two, there is no sacred or secular divide in living out your Christian faith. You are to live your Christian faith where you live, work, play, and worship all aspects of life. You can't divide yourself. When I'm in business, this, I'm going to act like this. When I'm in church, I'm going to be like this. When I'm out at, wherever I'm out at, I'm going to be like this. No, you are a Christian. You are a Christian where you live, where you work, where you play, and where you worship all aspects of life. You should be who you have been called to be. And so we live that out. Number three, the eternal values take precedent over temporal values. You know, in some business schools, not CCU, I'm sure, they teach you that shareholder value is the core. 
they teach you that that is the key, it's profits, your bottom line. Well, I'm here to tell you that that is important, but it's not the bottom line. The bottom line is that there's eternal values that's much greater than shareholder value. And that's what we're emphasizing. Number four, a Christian company is not necessarily better than a non-Christian company, but it must be different. It must be set on a higher level of standards than a secular company. But it's not necessarily better, but it must be different. It must operate at a level of excellence because you're under the microscope daily. And by the way, <laughs> the last one, you're not the owner of this business, but you are the steward of this business. You see Christ is sitting in the corner office of this particular business, and you're stewarding the resources of business, but he's at the corner office. He's the person that's calling the shots. He's the person that you're praying to. He's the person that you're going to on a regular basis and saying, Lord, what should we do? Every decision, every clutch situation should be brought before the Father. What would happen if businesses around the world took on those principles? Do you think anything would change? Do you think there would be a shift in America? Do you think there will be a shift in the way we do business, the way we think about business? You know, our worldview shapes our thinking, it shapes our behaviors, it shapes our emotions, it drives our actions. Worldview, it starts there. Well, these are the principles that shape our worldview. And here's what they lead to, that if God is truly the owner, we have the greatest corner office man in the world. I mean, we can do anything through Christ. I mean, think about that. The Bible is the ultimate authority of this business. We don't have to figure out what it says. We, we know what it says. There's 66 books that gives us what the Bible says. And, and so we read those, and we understand them. And we come to understand that we do have a plumb line. There is an absolute truth. Regardless of what they say, there is an absolute truth that we believe in. Whether you believe it or not, every knee will bow. Every knee will bow at the time of Jesus. And so we understand that we have a plumb line. We have the greatest standard for business than any other institution in the world. Christian businesses. We understand that prayer is the lifeblood of this type of business. It starts with prayer, it ends with prayer. Every decision starts this way. We understand also that we're called to work, live in a fully integrated, balanced life. There's no divide in our behavior. We're the same way wherever we go. We also understand that integrity is a non-negotiable. It is a non-negotiable. We also understand that there's a commitment to excellence. It's a hallmark of a Christian business. Unfortunately, many of us doesn't, don't practice that. And the minute you do see that fish, you run the opposite direction because we haven't demonstrated Christ-like behavior. But in this particular opportunity, we have a chance to show that a Christian business is different. Next and finally, this community is key to walk together. And we're walking with Christ Jesus every step of the way. Have you experienced a business that operates that way? Is CCU operating that way? Would you desire a life that operates that way in business? Think about it. Well, Jim Collins has a quote. He says, true greatness comes in direct proportion to the passionate pursuit of a purpose beyond money. And I would also add self. Are you a part of something that's bigger than you? Are you praying for something that's bigger than you? Are you being called to something that's bigger than you? Well, you may not understand that today. But when you're living both on purpose and with purpose, you don't just have a mission. You are on a mission. You're on a mission for Christ. And life becomes intentional. 
and meaningful because you're living missional. You know, a mission driven is by the love of the Father. It's for the Father. It's a love from the Father. And it's a love to the Father. And on this mission, the purpose is to develop mature and equip followers of Christ for the lost. Make followers of Christ through Christ's gospel. That's what I want to challenge you today is that you know Jesus. Now it's time to be about making disciples, making followers of Jesus Christ who go and make followers. That is the mission field I want to challenge for you today. Whether you do it in business or any aspects of life, that's the challenge that I put forward to you today. Well, I want to tell you how one young man lived out this challenge. He's from India, and he has come to America. Uh, this young man uh, had... Uh, what you would call the American dream on his heart. He left India at a young age and received his education in engineering here in the United States. Uh, he went on to open a turbo engine company in Connecticut. But he had a heart that continued to bleed for people in India. And so he went back and he began to establish a business in India, a turbo engine business. And in India, one of the challenges you face is corruption, called bribery. Not a small tax, but a big tax. And he didn't believe in that. He wanted to build a Christian-led business. And so he challenged the status quo. He wrote on the back of his business card a circle with a line through it that said, no bribes. No bribes. I will not pay a bribe to start this business. Many told him that he would last about six months in business. He struggled for about 10 years. But just recently, as he was telling me, after 20, 25 years of celebration in business, he is now one of the largest turbo engine companies in India. And not only did he just operate a business with these type of principles I shared to you, with you, he also realized that within his business were families who were enslaved, family members who, was in, who were enslaved. And so he began to inquire about them and began to buy families out of slavery. He began to buy about 42 families out of slavery. They were en enslaved for all types of reasons. You know, owing a dollar and fifty cents of American money, you know, they, you know, borrowing a loaf of bread or something of that nature, enslaved them not only in their life but maybe even their generation, the next generation. And so he began to buy families out of slavery in India. Well, he realized as he bought slaveries 